Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Mindful Warrior Podcast. I'm Eben Britton, joined as always by my brother Nate Jackson. We've got Jed Bauer on the ones and twos. <laughs> Gandalf the Grey is not in here today. But we have a very special guest, a uh, retired tennis pro, author, sports psychologist, and Athletes for Care member, Dr. Julie Anthony. Dr. Julie, it's great to have you here today with us. Well, thank you for having me. My pleasure. So you went to Stanford. You're a Stanford grad, Pac-10, yep. now Pac-12. It's gotten crazy. Um, you were a tennis pro for how many years? Uh, 10 years. Wow. It's a lot of tennis. Did, Did you know? Start, so, I'm sorry. Well, sorry. You know, I started when I was a junior and in college, tennis was not yet a professional sport. So wow. I spanned the transition from uh, tennis being an amateur sport to professional sport. So very cool. Um, as soon as it was professional, I was, I, that's when my career start, started professionally. And then I retired when I was 30, I don't know, 31, I think. And what, wow. when did you start? At what age? I started playing tennis when I was seven. And I, I grew up in Southern California, so it was easy to play tennis on the public parks. and Yeah, year-round. I'm sorry? Year-round. Yeah, year-round, free. Yeah. Um, I was just a little public park rat. That's awesome. So when you started showing uh, talent for tennis... What was the youth sports climate like then? I mean, now, as you know, when a child so shows skill at a sport, they put them in year round, right off the bat, and oftentimes that child gets burned out. So, what was your process uh, in becoming the tennis player you were starting as a child? Yeah, I, well, I'm just for all the reasons you just said. I, I'm so glad that I started when I started. Uh, my parents were very supportive, but they certainly never pushed. Uh, my brother, my brother started playing, my older brother started playing and, uh, he was four years older. And so when I was six, I wanted to start playing because he was playing and then they, they said I was too young. So I was just chomping at the bit to start playing and, and had, a a passion for it immediately. I'd run home from school and hit balls against the garage door in the alley for hours till dinner. And, and when I talked to parents, I, I, I emphasize that the child has to take the lead, that they can't, I think your job as parents is, is to expose your children to everything, but they'll, they'll go on onto something that, that they have a passion for. And if they don't have a passion for it, they're going to burn out eventually. And, you know, in, so in junior tennis, we always had those, those parents that would, I mean, I, I know of two cases where they actually, uh, beat their kid after right. losses uh, and then uh, Mary oh um, I'm forgetting her name but there's a, a, a pro on the women's tour that uh, at the French Open they actually had to hire Pinkerton guards to keep him out oh, no. keep wow. father out because he was so uh, such a disturbance so there are have always been those parents but yeah. Uh, in I, my experience is that as soon as the child is old enough to gain some independence, they will find a way to stop playing. So if you want your child to be disenchanted with a sport uh, and give it up, then push them. Uh, if you want them to love it, then let them take the lead and give them all the support you can. Actually, when I was – I started playing tournaments when I was nine – and um, the age group was 11 and unders. And so when I was 10, I had an undefeated year. Wow. You know, this is like real Mickey Mouse stuff, you know, 10 <laughs> years old. So, but, so my parents and my tennis teacher at the time thought that for the next year, I should play up in age category and not play in my age category because I wasn't getting the competition they thought I should have. And so I started losing sometimes. And my mother had no experience of sports, wasn't an athlete herself. And she had gotten kind of used to me always winning everything. So when I started losing, she was putting a little pressure on me and saying that I wasn't trying hard enough and um, that I wasn't being a tiger. And my back <laughs> to that was I just stopped playing and I took up bowling for a year. Wow. So uh, 
<laughs> you know, to their credit, they let me stop. Uh, but again, that's, I think, a child's natural reaction to feeling that pressure. So, And sure. for whatever reason, parents don't allow themselves to see that these days. They think that, you know, the more you pressure the kid, the more you get them out there on Saturday to practice extra shots or be- extra backhands, then they're going to be better. But I agree. I mean, I see these kids now and the parents and the way that they push these kids. Not only psychologically is it bad, but physically it's really bad to do the exact same motion over and over and over again. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and when you look, when I look at the champions in tennis, like a Steffi Graf, a Monica Sellish, a Billie Jean, the coaches had to force them to come off the court. Right, right. <laughs> It's never right. it's never a, a, a matter of, of trying to cajole them to do more. It's to do less because they have that passion. Definitely. Um, and so you decided after a year of bowling that uh, maybe uh-huh. maybe bowling wasn't the thing, and you and you reestablished your love of tennis. And then did you play for a high school team? Uh, yep, I played. I actually got a scholarship to go to a fancy girls' school in uh, L.A. called Westlake School for Girls because. Uh, a wealthy father at the school wanted to build up the tennis team because he had two daughters that played there. So I, I was <laughs> incredibly lucky because it was a fabulous education. And then I played for Stanford. And then um, <laughs> at when when I started at Stanford as a freshman, our tennis coach was a very, very rotund <laughs> uh, physical education teacher. I mean, it was uh, the, the, the men's team had a real coach and they had a real team. We just had this, you know, sorry mixture of girls that decided they wanted to play tennis. Um, and, and now it's a, it's a real force. Stanford has a fabulous men's and women's team, but, but just coincidentally, um, when I was a freshman, I was number two in the, in the, country for juniors and a woman named Janie Willens was I mean Janie Albert was her um, maiden name her father was Frankie Albert who was a quarterback for Stanford and then 49ers um, left-handed quarterback do you guys remember him at all I don't I don't look him up (laughs) we will quite the handsome quarterback guy (laughs) Um, anyway Janie was number uh, four in the country in the women's uh, division and Julie Heldman Uh, was another student there, and she was number six in the country. So we had this dominant women's tennis team, and we won the what what's now the NCAA's, but pure pure luck and happenstance. Will, yeah, if you guys have seen if you guys have seen the Battle of the Sexes movie, yeah, uh, Gene, I really want to see that. It looks really great. great. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty it's pretty accurate, but uh, the there's a, there's a woman um, who helped Billie Jean start the whole women's tour, and her name was Gladys Heldman. She was editor of a tennis magazine, and it's her daughter, Julie Heldman, that played with me at Stanford. So just trivia knowledge for you guys. That's cool. <laughs> and while you were at Stanford playing tennis, did you also have an inkling that you also wanted to get into sports psychology? Was that something that came later? I, I knew I wanted to, be, uh, in freshman year, I declared my major in psychology. So I knew I wanted to be a psychologist. And uh, it's only when I, re- when I was uh, still playing tennis, I was, and I was married to a fellow from Philadelphia. So when I retired from tennis, I ended up in Philadelphia. And um, the coach of the Philadelphia Flyers hockey team, and, and the captain, uh, Bobby Clark, the captain, and, and uh, Pat Quinn, the coach, knew of me and, and asked me to be their psychologist for the Flyers. Hmm. So that's how I became known, uh, known as a sports psychologist. Wow. Was that, that was after you were done, you retired from tennis? Yeah, it was 81 and 82. I was their psychologist. Wow. So you, that, that happened pretty quickly. I yeah. Mean, that, was, that was just a uh, chance, really. Yeah, no, it really was. Amazing. Uh, what what were you seeing then? What were you seeing with those guys? What 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 were they coming to you with? Well, I, it was such a new idea for them mm. that the first year I was with them, it was really edgy. First of all, just letting them get to know me. I, I went to 
I think I don't know if I went to every practice, but I went to a lot of practices. I went to every game at home. I went to games every game away, and so they could just hang out with me. And um, because there's a, you know, it's it's very confusing because management is hiring a psychologist. So, so are the uh, confidences of the players kept? confidential right or are my duties to management right so to to educate them about the fact that that there was going to be confidentiality that management wasn't going to know what we talk about um i actually ended up um giving little lectures on uh, nutrition and dry land training because i mean you have to remember 1980 it was especially i don't know if it was true in football but i was surprised at how ice agey things were <laughs> in nhl that that uh, during off season the guys would just go and drink and smoke and and show up to training camp 20 pounds heavier and right. and think that okay training camp i'm going to get in shape and they didn't even have the idea like maybe they should be in shape when they show Going up in, yeah. and, and uh you know a lot of the 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 guys coming out of colleges were very open to all of this and and staying fit and eating well but the the older guys were you know i remember being told like well pushing iron doesn't score goals uh, <laughs> you know so it's silly to train in the gym um and and so anyway just that was kind of the first year is just dealing with uh, thing, th- incidental things like, like you know, these guys um, do a lot of checking, obviously, and bang their elbows against the boards and get uh, lacerations, and then, and then they'd get infected. So they'd have these huge hmm. bumps on their elbow that, w- that would be painful. And I noticed that in the locker room, they were spitting, you know, they'd chew tobacco and spit on the carpet in the locker room, and then they'd lie on the carpet and do stretches. <laughs> yeah, perfect, perfect. <laughs> Dip spit's good for uh, wound recovery. Yeah, yeah that's good. Just mash it in there. Dish. You know, so I was able to get the locker room repainted and recarpeted and spittoons put in the locker room. And, oh, wow. You know, I just was sort of a troubleshooter for the first year. And then in the second year, um, and, and then also the first year I'd talk about, I'd give little lectures on, on the mind-body connection. Because, mm. again, it, it's, it's all so foreign. Um, you know, that, that initially they thought, well, if, the, if, if management hires a psychologist, they must think we're all crazy. Yeah. And, and, and she's going to look for our craziness. And so I had to educate them about sports psychology and how it's about performance enhancement, not looking for dysfunction or problems. Mm. Uh, how to improve uh, focus and concentration, how to, how to understand where you should be in terms of nerve arousal for your best performances. Um, and so then, then by the second year, I think the, the guys were comfortable enough with me to come for private appointments. But, but mm. also what was interesting is they'd, they'd make an appointment for nutrition and yeah. then they'd and then tell me that their girlfriend was pregnant or, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and did you feel comfortable talking with them about that stuff too? I mean, would, did your training allow you to kind of cover that whole gamut comfortably? Yeah, you know, and I, I really think that my experience as an athlete myself actually helped with my credibility with them, but also helped me with my comfort around them. That That having the athletic experience was this commonality that really – connected us and and there there was initially again a lot of awkwardness because of the fact that i was a psychologist and particularly because i was a a female you know that it was weird for for them to be around a female yeah Uh, in in a pack of men and that are just spending hours and hours together stewing in testosterone and adrenaline (laughs) and dip spit you know it's probably a pretty rowdy bunch well, what was so they were so cute <laughs> <laughs> because they really treated me very delicately. I mean, it's sort of like they were little schoolboys on their best behavior nice. around me. And uh, you know, they'd get embarrassed if they let a 
swear word fly. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> you had an you had a positive effect on him, Julie. Well, uh, who knows? Who knows? <laughs> well, for us, know. for us on a football team too, that that kind of all male dominated environment yeah. was even more. There's 53 guys on every team. You know, you got a, 10 or so guys who are on injured reserve who are running around that place. You got support staff, trainers, coaches, uh, and these are all males. And we yeah. just really never yeah. saw any females around Very little. ever. And we never had uh, any kind of professional interaction or conversations with a female we did not have a sports psychologist around you know all we had was dudes talking dude ways and just very aggressive and, and really there was no outlet for our emotional kind of reaction to the life that we were living and um, i think that's one of the biggest problems that guys have moving yeah. on is just they don't know how to express themselves right. they don't and they don't ha know how to have uh, a non- bar related conversation with a woman because the only times we would actually see women was out in social social situations mm -hmm. and um i don't know i'm a big advocate of trying to get more professional situations uh exposed to players now and getting them involved in life skills and getting them to be able to take classes or learn the language of the real world while they're inside this bubble because one of the things I found was also difficult was just speaking, finding your words yeah. outside of, of that environment where football is the only language that we would speak. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Athletes for Care, we have a member named Darren McCarty who is uh, uh, an NHL player, NHL legend, and we were talking to him a couple of weeks ago about the environment in the locker room, and, and it was about toughness, it was about drinking beer, it was about – dip spit like you said and uh the fact that the flyers brought you in to, to uh to help those guys it, it says a lot about the management yeah, at the time that, that must have been revolutionary at the time yeah it was it really was uh uh i got a lot of notoriety because of that <laughs> uh, but amazing uh, it's a shame that it didn't I mean, in, I, I was with them from 80 to 82, and then in 82, I, my husband and I moved to Aspen. Hmm. And, so, and then, coincidentally, they changed uh, coaching staff. And so hmm. uh, it, it, it was just good timing for a parting of ways. But um, I loved working with Bobby Clark and Pat Quinn. They, they were great. You know, Bobby, Bobby has uh, diabetes. Hmm. And... Um, and he had to, so he had to be smarter in how he trained and how he uh, prepared for for games, and and I think that led him to to be more like an individual athlete. Like I I, I think there's a real difference, or I noticed a difference in in tennis players versus hockey players. In that, as a tennis player, I had nobody to tell me how to eat, what, when to train, how much to train. Uh, you know, no one was. I didn't have a coach, and and. And so you had to figure these things out for yourself, which I think is, you know, can be very good. And yeah. whereas in in a team sport, your coach is God, and you're not supposed to. I don't know. Right. You tell me. No, absolutely. Uh, I I was definitely one of those guys. Looking back on my football career, um, just the yeah, these coaches were my God. This was my higher power. This arena, this environment, and you know. Uh, God forbid I, you know, betray that trust, that, you know, that pact of being in there, of, you know, making sure I'm, I'm being a good example for the coaches, for the team. I was always like a team leader and a team captain and really like a golden boy of the coaches, you know, look, I mean, I was the guy that the coaches love to have speak at the kickoff luncheons, for instance, for the mm -hmm. Jags, I was doing that just about every year. And, um, it was very, I was very wary of, you know, upsetting that. Mm -hmm. so. I'm wondering with you guys, I would imagine with the, the, the testosterone atmosphere you're talking about that there, that it wouldn't occur to anybody to show or talk about any weaknesses or talk about being super nervous or choking or oh, no no that no. stuff is because you're punished if you if you if, you're if you show a weakness if you yeah. show that you're in pain or that you have a doubt about the game plan or that you object to a, a coaching idea then you're kind of labeled as a guy who's going to rock the boat and someone we don't need around whether it's physical pain or mental pain or fear like you said i mean football involves running full speed at another human being and colliding with that person. Yeah. That is not a very, 
you know, that's a counterintuitive act <laughs> as far as preservation and survival go. But we had to do that every day and we had to act as if no big deal, you know. And so we all got hurt. We all had pretty devastating injuries that would end our seasons and eventually would end our career. But you're right. We, we couldn't really talk about it at all. And I feel like that's in some ways a strategy of, of management, because if you bring in people who, you know, start getting these guys to talk about their feelings, I think the management fears that it'll make them less effective on the football field if they're mm-hmm. thinking about their own emotions, if they're thinking mm-hmm. about their futures, which is really sad. And I think that's one of the hardest part about getting through to guys is, you know, because the environment that they're in is just all football or all hockey and nothing else matters. Um, I'm thinking back on my career and trying to think if I feel like there's some memory that's just not quite catching right now that we had someone like that brought in on one team I was on, a sports psychologist. Mm -hmm. And I remember, I'm I'm not sure, but I definitely remember the feeling of discomfort. It was a woman. Um, I think it might have been in Chicago. And, uh, you know, it was like you said, I think the first year was very much building the relationships with the guys, you know. Mm-hmm. And the next year was, I think, more guys were comfortable speaking with her. Um, but I think as men, it's really difficult to, sh- to share vulnerability, you know, mm-hmm. to, to show emotions, to show, you know, anything but strength and, you know, power. I think that that can be really difficult for men. And I think that's what this podcast is all about, you know, in many ways is changing that, you know, changing the way we take care of ourselves, changing the way we think about um, life, really. Uh, Mm -hmm. And could you could you let that facade down with your girlfriends or wives or at that point, did you not have a vocabulary for that? I looking at being, you know. My marriage has really strengthened since coming out of my football career, going through that. I, looking back, you know, my wife and I have discussions. I had no vocabulary then, you know. Back then it was, I came home from practice, from work. I collapsed on the couch and was, you know, in living in isolation, essentially. You know, it was mm-hmm. very, you know, and that's part of... that's part of leaving the game is, you know, your family and friends and all the people around you sort of allow that environment because of, you know, Mm -hmm. you're in this limelight, you're putting in these hours, you're making these insane, this insane amount of money. And, you know, you're taking care of a lot of people. So everyone kind of leaves you alone and lets you, you know, be the star football guy who gets to rest when he comes home and, you know, oh man, maybe we'll, you know, have a chance to talk to him at dinner and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Um, But it was very isolating. You know, I felt very isolated. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I also did not have the vocabulary to deal with that. (laughs) Every, every kind of personal life thing that would come up, football would be the answer for it. You know, I could put it on the back burner because I need to be the best I can be at football. So why, you know, why are we talking about this? And I did not have the capacity to I was very I was very cold because I had to be very cold on the field. Mm. I had to be very cold at work. I could not care about another the man's emotions that I am hitting as hard as I could. I didn't care about my own emotions. I had to squash those, you know. And so I and it definitely carried into my relationships. I was mm. not a very good yeah. boyfriend. I wasn't married and I'm uh, at the time. I'm not married now. I have a a different girlfriend now that I met outside of that environment. And I and I look mm. back and we talk about this often and I tell her I don't know if you would have liked the guy that I was when I was playing football. I was a very different person. And I feel like just this process of trying to discover the self is is so important. And it changes the way you look at those around you and the relationships. Um, I know that a lot of marriages do get strained after a career ends. Have you you dealt with some of that, the kind of the marriage problems that come? uh, With with, athletes? Yes. No, I haven't because you know up here in Aspen, I'm I'm not around any big major teams. Right. But I I mean, you, you know I think I think my impression of other sports and my experience with tennis is that it keeps you in a in a little bit of an infantile yeah. range yeah. where it's very narcissistic. It's about your sleep, your food, your training, your mm. game, and, and everybody's got to revolve around it. Right. And 
And so there's no um, learning to be sensitive to other people's needs and emotions and to develop empathy. Mm. And those are the things that are necessary in a relationship. So absolutely. But let me ask you this, you know, uh, again, I, I don't know what it's like in a team sport like that, but in, in tennis, you can just choke and really disappoint yourself and play terribly. And, and, um, and, and it, it, so I, I think that, that the players that didn't accept the reality of it and figure out how to, what to do about it, kept repeating it. You know, they become chokers. Right. And, uh, and, 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 then, and, you know, one of the, again, one of the things I noticed about, for example, Billie Jean is how honest she could be with herself. You know, it's like, she'd come in and say, Oh, I choked out of my gourd. And, mm. and, uh, but uh, in a, a match, a story, uh, a match she had at Wimbledon, for example, it was a great lesson to me. Cause I was a, a bit of a rookie on the, on the tour and she was playing this early round match in, um, at Wimbledon. Did, did I tell you this story? Evan? I don't know if you've told me this, but well, it's great. Keep going. It's a good one. Cause it, it's, it was such a eye opener for me that, you know, Billie Jean was, probably number one in the world, probably number one seated at Wimbledon. And she was out on a, a not a show, show cart play, in an early round playing a, a Czech girl and losing. And in the locker room, they had a TV where we could see the scores. It wasn't advanced enough to actually have video of the match, but we could see the, the progress of matches just by the scores. And we saw that, that she'd lost the first set. And then she, we saw the second set was kind of touch and go, and then she inched ahead and won the second set, and then same thing with the third set, and, you know, barely won the match, and so when she came in the locker room, she said, I said, Billy, what happened? And she said, God, I was choking out of my gourd, so I knew I had to spin my first serve and get my bahula up to net. (laughs) The translation of that is, if you're choking... You don't want to. You don't want to miss your first serve and be really nervous on a second serve and, mm. and you know possibly double fault. So to to spin her first serve in meant to hit it high over the net with a good margin of error and and make sure she got it in and to, and that would allow her to get up to net, which was her strength to volley. Mm. So the 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 epiphany for me was like, oh my god, as a rookie. I would never have admitted that I had choked. Right. I would think so shameful. And I would, who knows what excuse I would have come up with. But more importantly, not admitting it to myself on the court, I wouldn't have been able to devise a contingency plan the way Billy did. Mm. And I probably would have tried to ace the person with a first serve and try and hit winners and probably would have sped up my demise. And, and so the lesson for me is if you don't look at reality and deal with reality, you can't come up with plan B and give yourself a chance to win. So that's amazing. I don't know, thinking <laughs> oh. about that really goes into mindfulness as an athlete. You know, I yeah. think back on, you know, my football career playing in a team setting, you know, there are plays you get beat all the time. You know, I give up a sack. It's the most shameful horrible experience of of my day you know to give up a sack um and you know in football you don't have any time to think about that you know you have to get right to the next play and so you know as as i got older i think i got less able to distance myself from those mistakes and mm-hmm. you know they carried into you know plays they like i if i had a bad day it might be a really bad day you know rather mm-hmm. than being able to bounce back um but i think that was you know being tired the game my time in the game coming to an end uh and sort of losing this uh i don't know the this thing of as in football maybe nate you can speak to this as well but you know you definitely it's all muscle memory at at some point you know you get into a game and you're not thinking about the techniques anymore 
Right. And well, we also, in football, we did not have the freedom to kind of tinker with our own approach as a tennis player right. would to kind of figure out what is working best in the moment. We are we were overcoached in football. And so every movement, every right. play of every practice actually is videotaped from multiple angles. And then after practice, we go in the meeting room and we watch that film. Mm. And our coach tells us all individually – where we messed up on every play and exactly why and how to improve it. And so the, our own kind of personal freedom as far as style and creativity on the field is a little bit lost. That was one of the things that I struggled with the most with the NFL was the lack of creativity and freedom given to each individual player within the system because the system is yeah, cheese. I mean, point. it's like a, a, f- a math equation, science formula to these coaches, and there's only one right answer. Right. You know, yes. if, if this you guy does down. this, then you do that. If he does this, then you got to do that. And if he does this, you do that. If you don't do one of those three things, you're wrong and you're going to be out of here, you know? Yeah. And so the pressure to kind of make those coaches happy every day was very, very real. And one of the most stressful things about playing in the NFL was having to watch that performance every day on video in front of your buddies and having, you know, your coach call you out. And for a guy who was having a bad week, I mean, he was getting verbally ripped to pieces in front of all his best friends. And uh, I think that has some lasting, some lasting effects on guys. Well, actually with the flyers, you know, everybody's always watching tape about what what they did wrong. Right. And yeah. So what are you mentally rehearsing but exactly what you don't want to do? Right. So exactly. I asked them, I asked the coaching staff if they could put together a video of all the good plays that the the players made so that they could be so that that would be more impressed in their neural memory and not not the mistakes. And and again, what Billy Jean taught me, because um, we played a lot of doubles together, uh, she taught me to not start the next point. If I had made a mistake, I I didn't start the next point till I had mentally corrected whatever it was that I did wrong. Because mm. if, you, if you watch tennis, you'll see somebody dump a backhand volley in the net, and then they'll be ticked off, and they'll you know they'll sort of mimic it again. Well, that's exactly what you don't want to do. You're just you're just rehearsing your mistake. So to to not start the next point till you've corrected it, and then that's the that's the last thing you have in your mind. So for you guys to be overcoached and then shamed about yes yeah. Yeah. yeah total that shame is the worst. yeah so what that's... so how would you guys handle it if you screwed up? I mean, how would you handle it for yourselves mentally? Just try not to do it again. On to the next play. <laughs> but uh, yeah, the you know there's a, a new play every 40 seconds in football, and so you don't have too much time to be down on yourself. You got to get up and get back in the huddle. There's a new play coming. Coaches do stress that you know you got to have a short memory. Don't worry yeah. about the last play. Move on to the next play. Yeah. That's while the practice or while the game is going on. It's only afterwards that we're forced forced to sit in a seat and watch our mistakes, like you said. And there are they are not congratulating you for a job well done in there. That's not what mm-hmm. they do. We watch meetings to correct mistakes. And um, after a win. Our coach in Denver, Denver Broncos, where I played, uh, Mike Shanahan, he would show us a highlight video of our good plays the night before the next game if we had won the previous game. But if mm-hmm. we had lost the previous game, there was no highlight video. It was just you know a very matter-of-fact speech the night before the game. There were no awards given out. There were no T-shirts given out for nice plays as he did after a win. And so the reward system was definitely based on whether you won or lost. And even sometimes – during a loss, you might individually have a really good game. Mm-hmm. Uh, and even sometimes during a win, you might have a really bad game. But it seemed like they would only come down on you really hard as a team when you would lose. Um, but the daily kind of practice grind is difficult for a lot of guys to be videotaped at doing everything and then have to watch that. And some guys just would not be able to handle that and would fall out of the system simply because that was too stressful. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, and that's where the inner and outer game comes into play. You know that that you are are uh, targets of outsiders' judgment and observations and ridicule or praise, and uh, and yet you if you 
if you screwed up badly, but you had prepared as well as you knew how to do, you tried your hardest, uh, that's all you could ask of yourself. And that's, that's being a winner of the inner game. Right. right. The outer game is, is what your salary is, how many tournaments you've won, what your seating is, what, you know, blah, 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 all those things that are important, uh, sponsorships, mm. uh, I mean, they're important. You're, you 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 don't want to get dumped from your team because um, you're not you're not winning enough in the outer game. But you've got to, in order to feel, continue to feel motivated and to feel like you want to play to win, not to not lose. You have to give yourself credit for the values that comprise your inner game, which is for me, it was was my attitude good? Did I prepare as well as I knew how to prepare? Uh, was my effort level uh, up to standard, you know, what I would expect of myself? And, and uh, am I having fun? Did I, <laughs> yeah. am I enjoying touring the world? Um, so, uh, you know, and again, that's what I stress with parents is that is the fun factor. And I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but you had to have gotten into the game because it was fun. And there's got to, and you have to, it's, you get beat up too much if you're not continuing to have fun. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. absolutely. Now, let me so, ask you something because my daughter, uh, she's five. She just started playing soccer. Oh. Uh, it's pretty, it's fun. It's funny. <laughs> um, I was talking to someone there. It was a father. He has an older daughter who is a really talented soccer player who actually got, was so burned out she quit and had yeah. Hello. really a, uh, a, uh, uh, from what it sounded like a bright future in front of her. But he was telling me something that uh, some coach of a girls soccer, of a really great girls club soccer team told him. And he said that the great thing, the difference between girls and boys is that girls need to have fun to win and boys need to win to have fun. And I know that translated into my NFL career with grown men because losing, being on losing teams is not fun. It, it yeah. is a miserable year to not be winning games. And I don't know, I thought that was interesting, you know, talking about, you know, the inner game part of it and, and football in general. And is it is it that we keep coming back to it because it's fun? Or is it that it's it's got something else for young men, for young boys? It's like got this heroism factor. It's got this uh, sort of primal violence to it. But the uh, reward system too is very is very powerful in football. Like you were talking about earlier, if, if I perform well on the field, I earn the praise of a lot of you know big strong men. Whether it's the coaches or it's the parents around or it's teachers, and then it becomes media, right. and then and then all of a sudden everyone's kind of swept up in the momentum of your talent, and right. then and then all of a sudden you know you're in the NFL and you got more powerful men congratulating you and rewarding you when you do well and also scolding you when you do poorly. And uh, as far as winning and losing in the NFL. When you lose, everyone's worried about their jobs. Yeah, the coaches the especially. Yeah, there were. If a coach yeah. has a losing season, he's going to get fired. Whereas a player, if a player is on a losing team, he still might find another team or be on an uh, uh, on a team somewhere. But the coaches are really, really paranoid about losing. Ah, wow. Yeah. Well, you know that thing. See the thing about boys. Uh, girls need to have fun to win and boys need to win to have fun. I think that is a, a false dichotomy. Okay. And, and I think it's, a, it's a, a, a mistake in general because everybody can have fun if you're winning. Mm. I mean, winning's yeah, fun. That's for sure. <laughs> so, <laughs> but when you're losing, it feels like it's a mistake to think, well, um, it's impossible for me to have fun if I'm losing. I think if you can find the fun, it helps get to winning again sooner. That's uh, for sure. So, you know, I just, uh, and, and I enjoy listening to interviews, especially, you know, of any athletes, but, but during the Olympics where it, it seems like so pressure filled where you get to perform, at, you know, once every four years uh, at that level. And invariably the athletes will say, well, I'm here to do my best and to have fun. 
Right. Yeah. Big, yeah. You know? And, and, you know, it doesn't, it never means that you aren't tired and sick of it and stale and yeah hurt. And, but, but your love of the game transcends all of that eventually. And you stick with it because you, you know, you, you need to be disciplined. And, um, but I think I, I I don't. I can't emphasize fun enough when I'm talking to parents and kids. Absolutely. Yeah, no, Olympic uh, Olympic events. You will find people, I believe, who are more in it for the love of it because there's not. You know, the, a lot of the uh, events in the Olympics, there's not a lot of money involved for right. those people back home. Whereas there is in the team major team sports and even in tennis and golf and things like that. Um, which I find has a, has a lot to do with it because yeah, you know when we're a lot of the reason why I was playing especially at the end of my career one of the positives that I would note was the amount of money that I was making as my body was breaking down and I was having problems with the power structure and I was feeling unfulfilled even in that inner world the money was something I could say well that's 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 something good you know yeah. so I'm going to have to keep doing this as long as I possibly can because geez, look at how great this money is. And I think mm -hmm. that's, you know, a convenient thing for people to throw out, fans in particular, when they talk about football players voicing a grievance or having a problem with the way they're being treated. They say, well, look at all that money, you know? Shut up and play. And it's really hard in the modern world with hearing all those opinions of people who, you know, might not have your best interest in mind to have that kind of solid inner working to, to be able to feel comforted in what you're doing. Yeah, well, and also what you said earlier, Nate, about everybody congratulating you when you had a good game and scolding you when you had a bad game, it it reminds me of uh, at Wimbledon, when you play center court, you get escorted, because the entrance to it is where the, the member enclosure is, where the royalty you know, the members of, of, of the club and royalty enter, so you get escorted you, an usher comes to your locker room and escorts you to center court and you have to go down it's, you're, you're, you're you know my knees are knocking <laughs> and you're so nervous and you have to go down this corridor and over the archway of the corridor is uh, a, a, a fragment of a kipling poem from um a, a poem called if mm -hmm. and, and i'm gonna butcher it but it's <laughs> it's uh if if you can meet triumph and disaster in the same way then you're a man my son Right, right. Amazing. You know, don't get carried away. You, you know, you're not some superstar because you won a tennis match, and right. you're you're not a, an angel of a person, and you're not a devil of a person if you lost a tennis match. You know, so you have to have that inner center, that core yeah. of knowing who you are and what your values are. That that gets that's not altered by the highs and lows. Right. And I think that's part of the identity crisis that athletes have when they're done playing is that immediately. When you're stuck, when you decide to retire or you're cut from your team, you're no longer earning that praise from people. And so, where is your re where's your reward system coming from? Because nobody cares that I used to play for the Denver Broncos. I don't have a game anymore, you know. So who's there gonna who's gonna be there to tell me good job? And right. if there's no one there to tell me good job, I got to be able to tell myself good job and be comfortable with that. And that's the hard part. Exactly, exactly. And it's so, it's so. I mean when you're in those worlds, you're, you're in this microcosm and it's so important. It's everything, you know, you play a grand slam tournament and it's just so much pressure and it's so important. And now I, I marvel at the fact that I've, I'm an ex tennis player and I don't know who won the Australian open. You <laughs> yeah, know, yeah. it's like, it's not my whole world. And, and I, I can see it. It's, it's, uh, you know, a whole different perspective. And, and I knew at the time, that my goal was when I was on the court, I wanted to play as if it were life and death. Mm. And as soon as I was off the court, I wanted it to know that it was just a, a sliver of my pie of life. Mm. And I, that I think, I think you have to hold balance those polarities um, as an athlete, if you're going to come out healthy. And I think yeah. a lot, a lot of people like when Chrissy Everett retired, I remember she told me, she said she didn't know who she was apart from a tennis player. Yeah. She was really lost. Yeah. I was, I think it happens to a lot of us. Um, 
it sounds like you kind of had it figured out while you were doing it. You were aware of the dichotomy, which is very rare to have a an athlete who's kind of aware of the bubble that he or she is in yeah. while they're while they're there. Well, again, it was the advantage of 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 being part of that transition, mm. you know, because I never started out thinking I could be a professional tennis player because that didn't exist. Right, right. If, if you kept playing tennis after college, you were a tennis bum. You know? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know, I was always, you know, wanting a, an education and planning for life apart from tennis. So I, I was very lucky in that respect. Uh, you know, because I – because it, if you're, let's say you're a, a 16 or 17 year old girl and you haven't graduated from high school and yet you're really talented in tennis and you have the opportunity to go play and I mean to lose in the first round of the U.S. Open this year was fifty thousand wow. dollars. To win wow. the U.S. Open was three point seven million. <laughs> so. You know, you're a 17 year old kid, and your family's struggling, or maybe they're blue collar. And how do you turn that money down and right. say, "Oh no, no, no! I want to, I want to have a high school diploma." Yeah. Um, so I didn't have those temptations, which right. is great. Do you have tennis dreams? Because I actually have these football dreams sometimes, <laughs> and they're they're not me on the field scoring touchdowns or doing anything triumphant. It's always just this really awkward thing like the team's out there and I can't get in the stadium and I'm you know trying to get in and all the doors are locked or I'm on the sideline and the coach yells my name to get in and I can't find my helmet or my cleats are missing or something strange like that and I wonder I mean if this is going to happen for the rest of my life (laughs) (laughs) okay well I've had the same dreams (laughs) really that's so funny I what's amazing to me is I can't think of any tennis dream I've ever had (laughs) that's great (laughs) but you know, I don't. I'm not Freudian or Jungian, and I don't believe in intricate dream analysis. But I think what is interesting in dreams is, is the are the obstacles that you confront. So, like if there's if there's a door you can't open, uh, then I think, okay, what's going on in my life where I feel I'm stuck or that I, I want to get in some place and I'm I'm being barricaded from it or where. Where, where in my real, my waking life, am I feeling similar feelings? And often there's a, there's a, a connection that's mm. interesting. Yeah, that's interesting. Wow. Mine is always like the game is happening, lights are on, uh, fans are cheering, and I, I'm like running frantically around the stadium and can't figure out where the equipment is, <laughs> how I'm getting in. It's interesting. <laughs> Yeah, it is. There's a lot. There's a lot at play subconsciously, because I, I when I watch a football game now, I don't really care who wins. I have nothing emotionally involved, invested in the outcome of a game. I, I want to see guys play well, play hard, and stay healthy. Ultimately, I grew up as a 49ers fan. I grew up in San Jose, and I went to Menlo wow. College, so right down the street from Stanford. Um, but well, then and, you have to look up Frankie Albert because he. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. This guy I, played for the Niners. Yeah, for I started a out with the Niners and ended up on the Broncos. But uh, uh, yeah, well, Frank Albert was a coach for the Niners, um, and, and a part owner back in the '60s, I think. Oh wow, wow. yeah, it was uh, Bill Walsh. You know, those those days yeah. were kind of my uh, my upbringing, and I ended up getting to meet the man, and he became a sort of a mentor for me, and got me into the league, and helped get me to the Denver Broncos, and so uh, uh-huh. he, he's a very special man to me, and. We all need those types of positive mentors, but you know, I also always did want to please him as well, and I did not want to let him down. He mm-hmm. took a chance to kind of make a phone call on my behalf and get me to the Denver Broncos, and I took that very seriously, and, and I wanted to make sure that I honored that, you know, because there is that feeling of um, not debt, but you know, you don't want to let these men down who have helped you out along the way and and mm-hmm. sh- given you their time and and their yeah. wisdom. Um, mm-hmm. And I think th- th- that's a lot to do with it. Yeah. Um, well, and that's, yeah, that's a good amazing. point. Is that I I don't think I don't think people understand how much pressure you guys put on yourselves. That what it doesn't help you if somebody puts more pressure on you. Because your your standards for yourself are higher than anybody's probably, and so I think in coaching and and supporting an athlete, it, the object is to try and release pressure, not add to it. Yeah, 
And so you now you're dealing mostly with the parents of young athletes, or do you deal with with older athletes transitioning as well? Well, I, I my practice is a, is a general clinical practice, so I deal with relationship issues, depression, anxiety, hmm. eating disorders, and very. I, I don't um, every once in a while I'll give local lectures on. Uh, like one of the talks I give is on uh, what parents of, of children, athletes, what parents should know of, forget what the title of my thing is, but it's, <laughs> it's for parents with kids that play sports, how you can be supportive and not, not be pushy. That's great. Um, and, and then, um, you know, there are athletes, mostly recreational athletes. Not, I can't even think of any pro athlete in my practice right now. So, cause you know, everybody's on the road. Yeah. Uh, so my days of, of being exclusively a uh, sports psychologist ended with uh, the Flyers. Oh, okay, cool. And do you still play any tennis? I don't. I, uh, I, when I retired and I started skiing, I, I screwed up my knees skiing. Oh, no. mm. And so one knee, I'm, I'm trying not to have, uh, I'm trying to delay or not have a knee replacement and, so I stopped playing tennis about three years ago because tennis is just the hardest. I mean, I can ski, I ski bumps, I play golf, I cycle. Tennis is just rough. So you can still ski even with your bum knee? Yeah. Nice. I mean, maybe it's maybe it's a testimony to a low IQ. But no, no way. <laughs> no way. Well, you're you in the right. Do what you love. Yeah, and you're in the right place for that. Yeah, uh, you've got to out of self defense here. So you've been in Aspen for a while then. Um, since 82. Right. Yeah. And that's home now for you. Oh gosh. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Good. Where's home for you? Uh, live, living here in LA. In LA? Where yeah. in LA? Marina Del Rey. Oh, I grew up in Santa Monica. <laughs> oh really? Right down the street. Yeah. yeah, yeah I go there. Go. I go there often. I go there often. <laughs> well, no. I think, uh, I think we're going to wrap this up, but we really, we really appreciate you coming on, sharing your vision, uh, sharing your words with us. We, um, as you noted, we do need some more diverse people in here and to, to kind of open up the conversation. There are a lot more ways to talk about these issues. Absolutely. There are issues that we care about, and uh, that's why we started the podcast. So thank you, Dr. Julie Anthony, for joining us today. Thank you so fun. much. And uh, Eben, I'll, I'll, I'll try and connect you with any female athletes that I can think of. Yeah, definitely. We need future. to get some more female athletes in A4C as well. Yeah. Absolutely. But definitely. That'd be great. Well, well, nice seeing you in person and nice meeting you, Nate. Wonderful. Great Thank to you, see you, Dr. Julie. Say goodbye. Have Bye. a great day. Bye, Gerard. <laughs> All right. Bye. Well, you guys have been listening to us here on the Mindful Warrior podcast. Ow! That was Dr. Julie Anthony. We really want to thank her for coming on. Amazing. Very smart, very powerful woman. Great experience, great wisdom. That's right. We'll see you guys next week on the Mindful Warrior. Thanks for listening to the Mindful Warrior Podcast, brought to you by Athletes for Care, a health and wellness resource for athletes of all ages. Don't miss out on Nate's book, Slow Getting Up and Fantasy Man. Be sure to check out BringTheHurt.com, a pain advocacy platform dedicated to alternative healing practices. Visit BeTrueOrganics.com for all of your CBD needs. Use promo code BRITAIN, all caps 10, for a 10% off discount.